My name is Christopher Shade. I have a PhD that was in environmental metals chemistry, working specifically on mercury, environmental chemistry of mercury. While I was doing my PhD, I developed uh, and patented a technology for what's called mercury speciation. It's for separating different forms of mercury in a sample, be it an environmental sample or a human sample. We look at blood, hair, urine. What are the forms of mercury that are in there? And then when we compare the forms in the blood to the forms uh, or how much is in uh, the excretion products like the urine and hair, we can see not only how much is in the body, but how well the body is dealing with excreting those different forms of mercury. Because that's one of the biggest things uh, in terms of why some people have a toxicity and why some people don't. There's hypersensitivity that some people have that other people don't have. It seems to be a genetic lottery. A lot of that is related to how well you get rid of those forms out of your body. So that's uh, probably the importance of uh, the testing that we've brought is how much is in there of each form, which tells you where it came from, and how well are you getting rid of those forms, which tells you how much it's building up in your body long term, how much toxicity is going to be built up. And when I came into the clinical realm, I I was, I was really shocked and uh, the people working at it as clinicians are, are doing a great job and they're doing the best they can, but I came from environmental and I will say this with no compunction at all, all of the best mercury chemists in the world are in environmental right now. It's astounding that we know that if you expose a fish with eggs to a lot of methylmercury that the Embryos, those fish that are born, will have deficits in their glutathione system for the rest of their lives. We know this, no problem. We know that there's changes in genes that turn on and off from that exposure. But we have no data. We have nobody saying that this exists in humans at all. Like, oh, no, no, that doesn't happen. We know that fish with better glutathione S transferase activity have lower body burdens of mercury. We know that birds have the same relationship, but we don't know that this is true of people. So it was kind of shocking to me when I moved into clinical that the light on the mechanism of mercury was off. It was, we know mercury is bad, we know to throw these things into people and some of them get better and some of them don't. You have so many people coming up looking for answers and nobody's been able to help them. And these aren't just the ones who are like, my doctor told me I was crazy. My doctor told me I was crazy. I went to the naturopath and he couldn't help me. I went to the osteopath and he couldn't help me. Because there was big voids in the understanding of the different forms, the different excretion pathways, which ones are on, which ones are off, how the thing is supposed to work. My thesis is that you don't need to bring in the pharmaceuticals. You need to reboot, reboot the natural system and get it to drain. So we want to know, is the door shut, is the door not shut? How do we tell? Okay. Uh, we look at your blood. We split your blood into methylmercury and inorganic mercury. These are the two dominant forms of mercury in your body. The blood is dominated by the methylmercury form, assuming you've got both in you in reasonable amounts, because the methylmercury is more mobile into the blood off of the tissues. So it dominates the signal. So the old testing of doing total mercury in the blood really never had a good correlation with what came out in the urine. So there was all this, uh, I, I always call my talks looking into the black box, because there was all this black box theory. You know, throw a pill in, see what comes out in the pee, and we don't trust blood. Now if we split the two forms and we see exactly what's in there, now we find there's a very good relationship between what's in the blood and what's in the urine. When we look specifically at the inorganic mercury in the blood versus the urine, urine is almost all inorganic mercury. So now we're looking for a ratio. If your blood inorganic is this, then your urine should be this. All right, and we graph this relationship up. And what we find is some people their blood is here, but the urine is here. Re really what we see is that their blood is here and their urine is here. So their urine is low, but their blood is high, abnormally high for how much they have coming in. And that tells us that that gate is shut, and you see those blood levels creeping up, 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 up. 
We see this very strongly in older dentists who uh, for years have you know, very cavalierly used uh, mercury in their practice and you'll find extremely high levels in their blood, very low levels in the urine. So we see that the gate is closed. And then uh, the task of the practitioner is to open back the gate, normalize the function in the kidneys. Certainly in that case, we don't want to flush more mercury through the kidneys by doing the other kinds of uh, uh, the, the chelation, where now you're taking methylmercury and throwing it through the kidneys too. We want to open up pathways in the liver. We want to open up pathways in the kidney and allow the body to drain safely. All of the pathways necessary for metals detoxification are present in every one of us. They're working to different degrees though, based on a combination of genetics, previous environmental exposures, health, diet. So some people it's closed and we can open these things back up and the drainage can all happen. And then we want to support that. We want to support all of those natural pathways. Most of them are based around glutathione. So we want to support the glutathione pathways and naturally drain the body.